Hi, John Powell here again. So soon. Uh, uh, All Access Hollywood. No, that's not what it's called. What's it called? <laughs> well, John, thanks so much for sitting down again. It's always a pleasure to chat. Um, so we've done an interview, uh, like we've done a couple of these, but kind of, kind of, I want to treat this kind of like a reboot and kind of going back to stuff that we've talked in the past. So in case you um, don't know your history, let's start with the uh, people who don't know your history. Let's start uh, with the, the beginning. When was kind of the first memory you had where music kind of made an impact on you? Um, the very first. I'm trying to think if, I mean, there's, the one I always talk about is hearing the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, but probably there's other ones before that. I always wonder what they were. <laughs> I remember hearing a lot of Burke Bacharach as a kid. Mm. Um, Steve, uh, Stevie Wonder on the radio. My father, even though he was a classical musician, um, I think he kind of had enough of classical music. So <laughs> as a kid, uh, the only thing I ever heard him listen to was kind of, you know, kind of light music, maybe, yeah. which would include all that stuff. Um, but yeah, the, the, the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, which I, I, to this day I still do like. Um, and the Brook Violin Concerto, those are my favourites. And the Spalius. And the Tchaikovsky. And the Beethoven's very good. <laughs> and the, uh, the um, Kecheturian is very good as well. So I do like violin concertos. And Danny Elfman's uh, violin concerto is incredible. Yeah, absolutely I, I, incredible. If anybody wants to hear a real violin concerto, Danny wrote an incredible violin concerto. I saw you have his, uh, his big Tim Burton box set downstairs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, like, taking those, uh, I guess, those early childhood influences, um, growing up in, in the UK, kind of, what was that you know, kind of childhood like? Did you, were you playing in bands? Did you start writing your own pieces? Um, I, the very first sort of thing I did with the violin was to write some music on it, but mm. that probably involved a lot of open, <laughs> open string. <laughs> Um, and then I probably just played for a while, got got better at playing and enjoyed that. And then I and then I started to listen to probably other music. You know, um, I remember Queen, mm. a lot of Queen, yeah, uh, things like that. So I probably started to I got a guitar and started playing the guitar a bit and and writing things, um, but nothing really serious. Um, I remember playing. Beatles songs and things on the piano with friends at school, um, and then really uh, I didn't, you know, it was all classical really, and mm. it was uh, very much about um, these uh, this East Sussex Youth Orchestra that I was a member of, uh, and actually this year we've got a uh, 40th anniversary. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> um, of the first concert, the first official concert. Wow! Um, of which I guess I'm a founding member. I don't know so. Um, 20th, of, 20th of October this year, there's going to be a concert at uh, what was the Fairfield Halls in um, uh, in Croydon, uh, just mm. outside London. Uh, it's changed names to something, but um, uh, with the original conductor and as many of the original players, I think, are coming back. Uh, I'm going to try and take on Marla <laughs> Fifth, Marla's Fifth Symphony. Uh, and I'm attempting at the moment to write a piece for it as well. Wow! Concert, so we'll see. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> um, so, did you? When did I guess? Uh, at what point in your life do you make? I guess this is kind of start becoming a career aspect, like an aspect for a career. Was that always mm -hmm. the goal? What did you? Want, I guess. What did you want to be growing up? Was it always this? Was this kind of what you envisioned? No, not really. I, I just wanted to play music, mm -hmm. and then sort of just be involved in music. And as I realised that I was, it was going to be too tough for me to. I mean, I was sixteen, seventeen, playing the violin, and I wasn't really that. I realised how much work it was going to take to play properly, uh, <laughs> and it, it's really extraordinary amount of work and dedication you have to do to to take it to do it pro professionally. Yeah. Um, um, so I, I think I started to slip into kind of what are the what are my other options <laughs> uh, and the other options were you know composing producing maybe mm. I was just understanding maybe what a producer could do so but I, I I changed really from first subject kind of violin to viola uh, to get approval to 
to go to college as a to try and go to college as a composition student. It's a very quite hard to get in at first study composition in the, the four colleges in London, uh, the four conservatoires, uh, and uh, they all um, uh, turned me down except for <laughs> Trinity College of Music. <laughs> so I, I'll always thank Trinity and. Pr Probably Trinity College was the best place for me, so oh, okay. I went in onto that as a composer first study, and um, then I did piano second study, which didn't go very well, and then I managed <laughs> to swap that over to percussion, mm. which helped. And even though I wasn't a good player, it gave me a, a lot of time to play with a lot of the instruments and yeah, yeah. experiment. Um, and you know, and I did things. I did a bit of conducting in college, and sort of started a little mm. opera group. Um, for all the people who weren't in the college opera uh, each year, you know, right, they right. were kind of left out. So we we started doing that, um, and lots of modern music, mm. lots of other people's music, lots of glass and Reich and mm. things. I was more into that than um, you know the kind of boulets and things, uh, which is probably why I didn't get into the Royal <laughs> College. Um, and uh, then. I did four years of that, uh, and and it was it was wonderful because you just I just got to play. They had an electronic music studio. I was there all the time. Um, I knew basically every term you have to just come up with lots of new pieces, and if you don't, they'll throw you out. But if you do, and it's not terrible, I guess I got to stay in. Yeah. And had a great teacher, uh, Richard Arnell, who was this wonderful old um, sort of British symphonist. You know, in the old style, <laughs> but he was also very, very open-minded and had uh, worked in film as well. So that's when really it started because he, mm. we were there, and, and uh, he he um, he had connections to the International Film School down in Soho. So um, a few of us were sent down there to work. You know, to mm. sort of not we didn't really enrol. We just went to meet with the the you know film students, and and then. We got to write some music for these short films that they were doing, most of which were terrible. <laughs> I remember one of the <laughs> scores I did, um, I gave it to them on, you know, in those days, quarter-inch tape. Yeah. And there's a thing about tail out. You always put tail out on quarter-inch tape because then other, otherwise, the, if you put it tail at the front, if you wind it back, tail at the front, the, the tape prints through and you hear a pre-echo. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you always put it out at the back. But whoever transferred it at the school, <laughs> the <laughs> student didn't know. So they transferred the whole school backwards. So I went to see the film and they'd actually used the whole school backwards. <laughs> so the question is, did it, obviously, was it not that noticeable that it was going backwards? <laughs> it kind of says something about the composition. Maybe it was a bit rubbish. They're like, oh yeah, this sounds perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever um, John did is working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you got a, a, like a taste of that, um, and you mentioned your teacher. To, I mean, uh, I just did a recent kind of article about uh, mentorship and, and kind of the importance of, of mentors. And so, you t and were there any other kind of influences? Of course, I mean, you can talk about Hans, but any kind of early on in teachers that, like that that kind of helped push you in that direction? Oh yeah, I mean, everything, sort of everything I've ever written and enjoyed and playing and sort of thought about as being kind of the the peak of musical achievement was sort of developed really within the Sussex Youth Orchestra. Mm. And so Colin Metters, who was the conductor of that, is just, he's one of the most important mentors to me. Mm. Uh, which is why it's very hard to write this piece, because <laughs> I'm, writing, I'm writing a piece for <laughs> somebody that, I must admit, I haven't seen him in a long time, but he was such an in influence on me. Yeah. You know, it's like, if he thinks this is shit, then I, I, I don't know how <laughs> I'll survive it. But uh, I have to try and write something that he'll think is worthy of, of us playing. So um, he was very, very important. He, he gave me, you know, uh, every, you know, Christmas, Easter and summer we were, we were rehearsing mm. with this orchestra and doing different symphonies. And, and he had an amazing, he was very straight, very tough. Um, mm -hmm. He did not treat the orchestra like a bunch of kids at all. He taught them and treated them very seriously. So. But he will. He would also back it up with great musical, a hugely great musical understanding. So he was one mm. of the most incredible educators. Uh, and then obviously, yeah, Tony at, um, you know, several teachers at, at, at college. Um, you know, the electronic music teacher was fantastic. 
Um, I mean, all sorts of people, really, and people you work with, my friend Gavin. Yeah, I mean, you and Gavin <laughs> you know, go way back. <laughs> yeah, and his father, you know, who's a great songwriter. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, it was wonderful to be around. Um, and then I, I, got, I got some gigs working um, in jingles. You know, That's right. a jingle yeah, yeah. company. In the, right. And then you start to hang out with other composers, and I was working for other composers as well as doing my own stuff, and that's when I met Hans mm -hmm. uh, and Patrick Doyle. They're both, they were writers. Course, yep, you and Patrick, both writers yeah. there. So, um, you know, th then that suddenly becomes a possibility. I hadn't really thought of doing film. Um, I was really just doing advertising because it paid, <laughs> and it's very hard to take a, you know, um, an education in composition and make money. So. <laughs> But then you have to boil everything down to, you know, advertising probably was a good school to just kind of train you to get down to, boil it down to as, down to the core of what you needed to get to, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and learning the communication skills with people who, you know, the famous one is, can, it, can you make it sound more like an avocado? Um, I don't know if that's ever actually been said, but that's the kind of the, the gig. I certainly heard uh, chocolatey. Uh, can you make it sound more chocolatey? Chocolatey. Yeah. So, you know. and today, how would you make it sound chocolatey? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I gave that a long time ago. So at that point, you're working, you know, of course, with Patrick and, and Hans. Um, how did that transition happen where you left the UK and came to the United States? When did that come and what made you decide to, okay, time to leave and start a life over there? Well, we, uh, Gavin and I had been working a lot uh, with our, our very good friend, Michael Petrie, who was an artist, and we'd done installation art pieces, a lot of them, mm. and, uh, and performance art pieces. So even though we were making money in jingles, uh, and we'd actually even started our own company uh, in Soho doing that, um, we also were doing all of this kind of crazy stuff with <laughs> Michael. Uh, and we, one of the things that he did was get a commission in, um, in Bonn at the at the National Gallery of, mm. of uh, Germany and they commissioned him as an artist and they said, what do you want to do? And he said, I'd like to write an opera. So he came to us and said, you want to write an opera? And so we did, the three of us wrote an opera together and Gavin and I did the music and, and he did the libretto and the book, okay. as it were. And, uh, and then we, it's a small ensemble. And so we're actually, next year, I'm going to re, we're digging that up and re, going to re-record ah. it and then try and get some performances of that, because uh, it was fun. And I remember thinking, I'd met with Hans, and, and he'd said, um, he'd said, you know, if you want to come out to Hollywood, we've got, there's a lot going on, so I need some help, which was very exciting. But I remember yeah. thinking, I don't know if I'm ready yet. I just, I'm not sure if I'm kind of, if I, I don't want to go too early and not be, not have my chops ready. So- Were you like afraid of failing? Like going out there and just like falling on your face? No, I was afraid of not having the kind of the, the technical side of it mm, down. Okay. I knew, yeah. I knew at that point, you know, he introduced me to his world of kind of samples and everything. I mean, I'd been very technical before then, but when I saw, when I worked with hands a few times, uh, you know, uh, it was an amazing kind of realization that there's just mm. another level of, of technique right. of the sort of the more this, what everybody does now, but at that time was very unusual. Um, and I realized I needed to get up a level. And uh, so, and I had plenty of stuff going on in London with Gavin um, as well. So, and then we got this commission to do the opera and, and finishing the opera and getting through it, I kind of remember thinking, okay, I, I think I'm, and now I'm ready. Mm. So um, then Gavin and I basically sort of, you know, flipped a coin and <laughs> see who go first. <laughs> and I went first and got everything organized and then he came out sometimes and we sort of swapped around a bit yeah came out and see just to see what the lay of the land was and uh, before you knew it i was i was kind of working and then gavin was working but he didn't really enjoy it as much so he he went home after a few years mm. and um i'm still here yeah. <laughs> uh, those uh those early days at uh media ventures um was it intimidating were you did you feel kind of in your element uh, right off the bat or yeah. was it easy to kind of grasp it yeah, I mean, I suppose it's intimidating, but no, it was exciting and difficult, and um, there was a lot of very good composers there. So, you know, there's this kind of environment where you are both blessed with the ability to be able to sit there at three o'clock in the morning and talk to somebody else about the difficulties of writing this particular cue. And, <laughs> right. Uh, but then there's also lots of other people who, you know, are up for every job as well. <laughs> so, how you get ahead, it's all really, it was always really about. You know my relationship with hands. I, I 
I admired him so much that I wrote, I generally wrote the music for him. Mm -hmm. So even whatever I was doing, uh, even I did some jingles for his, for his company, mm. you know, I did uh, all the TV series and things. And I was always thinking, I wonder what Hans would think of this if he walked in right now, which sometimes he did and sometimes he didn't. Um, and I just sort of always tried to impress him. And I think it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> yeah. um, what did you kind of take away? What did, was he able to teach you in those early years that you didn't get from, uh, well, you know, from your teachers or anything like that? Was it just more kind of the business sense of things that you kind of got to grasp early on? <laughs> I mean, with the greatest respect to all the teachers, there's nothing that they know about that world. But, yeah, of course. You know, really, and, and I mean, I, I just I think it's very. I can't imagine how I would have learned without hands. I mean, obviously, I learned a certain amount in in London, you know, with advertising and um, and then I did TV series. I worked with, a, you know, other com composers like Tim Suster, who was mm. wonderful. Um, and, but Hans was, you know, it was obviously at another level. Um, and, I mean, he taught me, he taught me kind of everything, really, uh, very quickly. I learned everything very quickly. Yeah. Um, again, maybe waiting a little while until my actual chops were my kind of compose composing orchestration in in the box as it were yeah all yeah. of that i got mm -hmm. my i got those chops really much stronger than they had been and they were really kind of ready to go and that's that became the essential part of it for when you know you get things thrown at you so the first things i was doing was just doing song arrangements for prince of egypt and i did some adverts and i did a tv series and and then hans came back to me and uh, we did this um uh, film for Terence Malick called Endurance. Together. Yeah, which is a fantastic um, score. Yeah, and that was that was one of those things where he was sort of loving kind of being with Terry Malick. But as we began that, he was stuck on something else so much that we just had a few meetings and mm. then we'd go away and write. And by we, I mean I I wrote, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he never wrote. So it ended up I just wrote everything for that, right? Uh, which was absolutely wonderful but it, and that the you know the guidance on that one with with hands was great but terry was also wonderful he treated us both like great artists yeah you know, and he didn't know who the hell i was um and then um, a job came in for hands you know from john Wu. we'd worked together they'd worked together and he really wanted hands to do it and hands basically sort of put me up for it and and talked me through it and uh it's funny i was just finding all the bits of that the other day um just like hundreds and hundreds of like demos I did <laughs> for about <laughs> two and a half weeks just wow. trying to get it all done you know just trying to get the gig yeah yeah uh, and then you could see the dates of them going right up to um, you know sort of like just before a presentation day which I remember was on a Friday when everyone came and listened to the ideas wow was that then, was that nervous like presenting that and like yeah, of course. Okay. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, for your first kind of big feature, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was a yeah. 80, 80 million dollar feature. Yeah, it was it was crazy, really, the the chance of getting to do it. But um, you know, and I knew that they wanted hands, so I had to be within that language. Right, um, right. But you know, I think it. I can't quite do him. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you have your own sound, and it, and it. You, I heard that in Endurance, and of course, Face Off, um, and we're you know talking about. Uh, working under Hans and, and getting that kind of lay of the land. Now, at this point in your career, I mean, you don't have uh, as big of a kind of operation as Media Ventures or remote control and keeping oh, it no. small, but you do have an amazing, uh, you're working with young composers like Batu Sener and Anthony Willis. So as a kind of a mentor yourself now, how do you be a teacher also having them work, but like letting them learn, letting them grow? Like, what is your approach, I guess, to being a mentor? Yeah, I mean... Uh... I'm not deliberately a mentor. I yeah. mean, I'm just, I need help. And yeah. so you kind of, you need to inform people to try and get them to, mm -hmm. the other option is they just do it wrong and then you don't like it and then you do it yourself. <laughs> so the closer you can get them to what you need uh, in helping you, um, you know, the quicker it all goes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I try to sort of tell them what I know, which is obviously always about you know the picture is like what what is the film doing here right. why are we doing this you know why is this scene here um, so hence what's the purpose of the storytelling point so then the music goes behind that 
Um, it's amazing how you can just move on and write things in scenes, and you don't, you're not really sort of, you're just reacting to what you see. Mm, yeah. Um, there's a lot of scoring goes like goes on like that, and I mean, I think everybody's guilty of it. Uh, I have been, um, but I've tried to get out of that, you know. And, and the hands would have been saying the same sort of things to me, um, but I, I really try and make very clear uh, in each scene that I work on with, you know, with other composers what we're trying to get. So I'll do a sketch, they'll, you know, they'll start fluffing it up and, um, you know, as long as, I think it's very important that they understand exactly what I'm trying to do right, right. in each scene uh, and what the point of each, you know, melody is doing. I'm, I'm a big stickler for kind of getting sort of logic, mm. internal logic in the thing. I mean, I don't think it matters to that many people, but it's just part of my own sort of um, little, um, a, you know, OCD madness. Kind of madness yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but I, I also think it 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 gives me a sort of a form to work in, that then I I understand the film better by trying to understand the threads and allowing the having themes that follow those threads. Um, so it it blends together at least for me uh, in a in a, a logic. But then I, obviously. It, just at a purely kind of, uh, you know, what you see is what you get level, you have to make the scene sound right, even with whatever theme you're, <laughs> you're right. using. Yeah. So it's hard to try and sometimes get the themes to work in the right way. You have to have themes that you know are going to be flexible enough to, to, to cover the ground that you need to cover in each, in each scene. Mm. So do you feel like you are a better storyteller now than you were like 20 years ago? Oh, God, yes. I had no idea what I was doing. Really, <laughs> like, it was amazing. Like when, you, like when you found those face-off demos, were you shot? Like, did you listen to them? Were you like, oh my no. Um, no, we just found the um, the sequences. Mm -hmm. You know, the original sort of logic sequences. Um, so I couldn't, and they. It's very hard to open those now. <laughs> um, but but do, you, um, do you ever listen to your old stuff and go, who's that guy, or do you recognize that guy? No, it always sounds kind of like me because it's got all the sort of. The fetishes in it that I always go for, <laughs> yeah. um, mostly. But I don't remember how it fits with picture. Sometimes, if I'm cruising through, you know, kind of TV, I, I you see something from a long time ago, and then you I watch a little bit of it, and it either makes me squirm or it's <laughs> like I seem to know what I'm doing. But right. um, no, I mean, it was George Miller that really kind of sort of finished off my mentoring <laughs> education as far as. <laughs> Uh, film, you know, I mean, I, I just yeah. working with him and storytelling. I mean, I really started to finally understand storytelling. I think. So, um, in your opinion, what is the purpose of score? What is the purpose of music in film? It, when you because when I think about it, it is such a weird concept. You know, there's music playing, but in life that would seem weird walking down the street. Yeah. But and you look back at how film started. Of course, sitting in a silent theater was weird. So they. St played music to make you feel engaged? I mean, today... Like... Well, it was just to cover the noise with projectors yeah. <laughs> originally, so it was, it was just a distraction. Uh, and then they, I think they noticed that, you know, you could kind of, you could raise the emotional stakes. Right. And yeah, I mean, that's really all it's supposed to do. It's just supposed to follow the, I don't know, the, the emotional reaction that you can have as an audience member. Um, but obviously, there's a subtext to the story that the music can attach itself to that mm -hmm. brings a lot, um, a lot more um, complexity and, and paradox, mm. which of course is the basis of all art, um, to the scene, right. to the to the storytelling. It's, um, somebody can be saying something, but the music can tell you that they're lying, um, or that they don't believe it, or that they're missing the whole point of something. They actually just don't understand, um, and that. That suddenly makes characters in in these stories more believable to us, I think, because we understand them more. Absolutely, I mean, you can see lots of there's lots of films that don't do that, and lots of TV that doesn't do that, but the really good stuff is always doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so your early filmography is I, I I really love because it's so varied. You, you tackled all these different genres, um, whether it's Face Off and Ants. Um, I mean, the forces of nature. Like you're kind of jumping around these different genres. Uh, was that 
was it just by chance because you were just the projects that were coming to you or were you kind of seeking yeah. out not to typecast no. yourself or no it was just luck <laughs> so really, um, and also i mean i was a bit all over the shop musically mm. I, think I hadn't quite you know the danger would have been at the end of um, face off to get more gigs just nothing but action films right right and i was so exhausted from it that i think i i kind of was a little bit hesitant to do that which was in retrospect, maybe not the best idea because I could have probably got a few more big films. But mm. instead, I decided to kind of try and do smaller films to sort of change, and and it almost stalled everything. I think um, so. I'm not sure that was a good idea. But the result is that you know I, I got back into it with Ants, thanks yeah. to Jeffrey Katzenberg. We had a hit with that one, and then that was off and running really from there. So yeah. I almost didn't quite you know make it along. And um. Yeah, you mentioned Jeffrey and kind of uh, let's talk about your how important like DreamWorks has been in your career. Mm. And I mean, starting with Ants and oh, Prince Prince of Egypt and Ants and um, Shrek and I'll just keep going and going, leading mm. up to of course El Dorado. El Road to El Dorado, which is I think one of my underrated. I love that score. I love the film. Um, I mean, it's like perfect. It's just a great swashbuckling adventure. It's, it's great. Um, but leading up to of course How to Train Your Dragon and the whole trilogy that you did with mm. Dean and. Um, but what were those early DreamWorks days compared to now? Like, how do you kind of see your DreamWorks as kind of this kind of through line through your career? I, it's it's crazy. I mean, they they just formed. I arrive in Hollywood at the same time as so does their first movie. You know, right. Prince of Egypt. Um, what a bold first movie, too, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, for your animation studio, movie. it's yeah, a fantastic movie, film. Yeah. yeah, until until the Burning Bush, and then it's like, <laughs> and then even then, I understood that there was. You know, unfortunately, religion kind of sort of ruins storytelling a bit. <laughs> no, I know the, we're, you're an atheist, or I'm an atheist. Yeah, so. <laughs> but because of the, the magical aspect of it, yeah. it's like suddenly it stops being a kind of a something you understand on a human level, I guess. Right. You Absolutely. It some yeah. other way, but um, it's always like a cheat. This is this is why I don't really like superhero movies. It's just a cheat. It's a okay. giant cheat. Yeah, all you, time. Can, it's like, you can okay. always just explain it. Oh yeah, it's, yeah. Because yes. yeah, everybody's beating everybody else up at the end, but they never die, and you know. I know they do a bit, but you know, um, <laughs> so it, it, it's a problem for me. So, God films and huge superhero films, sort of the same thing. But it, it was a it was a wonderful movie to do, and I mean, um, I got to work on some, you know, some great stuff with Hans. He'd already done the opening, which was oh. amazing. Um, but it was some of the other songs and a lot, a lot of the arrangements I did were for songs that never ended up in the movie. <laughs> I kind of managed to prove that they didn't work or maybe i'm not sure um <laughs> but uh, they're all great songs they're uh, fantastic the songs. Songs. stephen shorts yeah yeah i mean he's a genius i, I loved working with him as well so yeah he was, and he was very he was very kind absolutely very kind to me, so. um shrek of course another a big you know thing you did with harry yeah um yeah. and that's i mean harry went on to finish the the franchise but we'll talk about working with harry you guys had a really unique relationship yeah um we didn't know each other until you know it was kind of was it a, a Katzenberg or Hans putting yeah, it, it together? Was Katzenberg, Teddy, Ger- <laughs> uh, Jeffrey. I think Hans wanted somebody else to do it. One of the cases, but no, he he, um, he very kindly just had worked with Harry on Prince of Egypt, who helped Hans with the score, and I'd done the songs, and he just liked us both. I think we were a bit kind of obviously, you know, determined, mm. I think, and pushed really hard. And he could see that, so he just suggested it, because Hans couldn't do Ants. Otherwise, he would have done it, but he was on something else. Right, right. Um, so we got thrust together, and I didn't really know Harry. I didn't know his writing, and um, and obviously it's very interesting because I'd done a lot of collaboration with Gavin, so I had no problem with it at all. It was it was easy for me. I think, you know. Harry had obviously collaborated a lot with Hans, but this was a different thing. I was yeah. not Hans. Right, right. Um, so we then had to sort of rebalance ourselves um, a little bit. And Hans, I'm sure, would make sure that we knew that who, we, you know, what <laughs> the other one was doing really good work, and you know, what would what could I do to, you know, you know. So I think uh, there was a sense of competition about it. Yeah. And it, and it it was only good for us. So you know, did you guys get along, or did you guys? Oh but, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I love Harry. He's he's. he's uh, He's wonderfully crazy, and uh, he's a brilliant composer. Oh, well. yeah, so yeah. it's easy to kind of work with from that point of view. But he's obviously very—he's got his style, and he—and he's got his opinion on how For things sure. go. So we had to sort of work that out, 
And then you have Hans would come in as well and have his opinion. And then you have a large music sort of department from DreamWorks would have their opinion. And then you'd have two producers, two directors. <laughs> but really, the only person you needed to listen to was Jeffrey. <laughs> so um, it was it was most of the time it was it was a big crowd of people. But yeah, yeah. I always remember that the first thing that would come out of Jeffrey's mouth as soon as you finished playing a cue to them for the first time was probably the only thing you needed to listen to. Really. Mm. Um, the solution obviously needed to be found somewhere else, but uh, the fact that Jeffrey would make a comment on things, he would often just get, he'd just get that really obvious thing that the audience is going to think. Yeah. And that's the stuff you need to think about. That's right. The stuff about, yeah, I realise I'm going up a dead, a dead end alley here with this because... Nobody's really thinking about that. That is not the p purpose of this scene. So then <laughs> why is the music doing something that it's, it's not needed for? Yeah, and absolutely. So uh, I, I think I probably learned an awful lot about storytelling as well with, with Jeffrey, really. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, not, he's, not a, he's not a sort of a... He's not, he's not telling you mm. how to do it or what you do. He just reacts. He's very, he's very wonderfully reactive and just clear about his reaction to these absolutely. things. Absolutely. Um, so kind of fast forwarding, let's uh, talk about uh, dragons. Uh, How to Train Your Dragon was 2010. That's a good good amount of time ago. And over those three years, three films, a complete trilogy, which is rare, I think, in, in these days. It's not going to continue going on and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So you had a guy, we're able to resolve the story and come to a conclusion. But what were your first memories of that film? I know we had a nice chat, you, Dean, and I. And Dean was mentioning he came late to the project. Were you were you on the project before Dean and Chris no, were? No, or no, no, no. So no. they yeah, they would just come on, um, and then I, you know, I was in, introduced to the books by the producer, Bonnie, and um, and you know I I just read the books and then came in for a meeting, saw the artwork, and and met with everybody, and uh, it just seemed wonderful. Mm. Yeah, but I didn't really realize how good it was at the time, I must say. I remember I realized how good Trek was at the time, but Dragons I didn't see. I couldn't quite work out if it was working until really quite late on because the some of the animation came in and I just realized that this is just absolutely the best animation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then and I, I realized that Chris and Dean had such a, a great sense of story you know for that and, and it was it's such a kind of a an emotion it was an it's a very emo emotional story very. but played very very cool all the time yeah it's, it's never allowed to you know you'd never see the emotions i mean that's the whole thing about vikings and men they never say their emotions um so i think that's why i got to be much more emotional musically as well and try to be warmer and richer yeah yeah um, so it was a, it was a great you know i like to i like to think it was it was sort of easy, but it, of course it wasn't. I'm sure it was very hard. <laughs> They're all hard. I mean, it was, it's a, it was a mature film. It felt mature, even though yeah. it was for you know family audiences, and it had the, kind of the goofy jokes and the goofy side characters. But there was a maturity with that relationship with Hiccup and Toothless, and of course carried into the second one and third one. Um, in your in your point of view, how did the score evolve across those three films? Um, I guess it it matured a bit. Number two. Mm. Uh, and then it it reflected a bit more in number three. It reflected on its on its life, mm. <laughs> <laughs> which I was doing personally as well. So um, I think that's why it kind of uh, it, it worked. You know, it's it's interesting. Uh, the I, I've lived I've lived the last sort of ten my, ten years of my life with those films, and and it's been a very interesting ten years. Yeah, I mean, ten years. Uh, a lot yeah. happens in ten years, and yeah. then yeah. Yeah, I mean, I did the first one, and then I remember my wife was given um, a diagnosis with breast cancer mm. uh, on the day I got nominated. And then, um, and then she was going through kind of a hell of a, uh, a you know, an ordeal with that on yeah. the second one. And then, of course, she died, and then I did the third one after she died. So, um, so they live, they live in my uh, kind of my, uh, you know, my life. Um, the you know the, the the level of my sort of uh, personal kind of connection with these films, it, it, you know, obviously it's never going to be there for anybody who doesn't know me. Yeah. Um, but maybe it's there emotionally. I don't know. Um, you know, it's the sort of. I think the first one's the most joyful. 
Um, the second one is definitely um, hunkering down and dealing with some difficult stuff. Mm. And then, as I say, I think the third one, this one, um, is my most reflect. It's a very reflective score, and it, and it because there's I had an, plenty of material from the first two as well. I I was able to reflect on that, but I knew I couldn't rely on it. Mm. That's one of the tough things about it. Um, and I didn't want to rely on it. I, ne I needed to. I needed to make a whole um, arch form within the film, the third film, and I needed strong material for that as well. Um, but it. But the original material, some of the original material, gave me these kind of book golden bullets that I could use. And I, so I was very careful to use them. But it, that's the reflection: is just that you know these. You can use these great memories. Yeah. Um, but you need to sort of keep moving and, and make, <laughs> uh, move forward and, you know, so I think that's in there. Yeah. No, I mean, at sure. least that's what was going through my head. I know. It's, <laughs> it's going through in the film too. I mean, the, the way the film ends, it doesn't end on a, and then, you know, we see moving forward towards the end too and you were able to capture that, I think. I think Dean did and, you know, I mean, I think Dean was explaining he wanted to end not, you know, we go... Spoilers, but yeah, we go see Toothless is with his family. We see there's life moving on. Everything is mm. going forward. I think there was that theme in there too, even though... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so talking about... Um, you mentioned kind of your personal life and kind of all that stuff. Do you draw from your personal life into your work? Is that kind of... I mean, a lot of people say they like to like, oh, I'm not going to... Like, if I need to feel sad, I'm not going to think of pain in my life. I'm going to try to keep it towards the film and pull from the characters or do you kind of mix do you have a fine line between your creative vision and or do you draw from your wealth of experience of life a good question i don't know i mean you do try and you do try and really love the characters in the story and yeah. and, and you know and, and mote with them but where does that i mean at the whole point of storytelling is that we sit in a dark room with, with a bunch of other Strangers. people <laughs> and we feel things together mm, yeah. um, we connect with the characters and we're connecting with the people next to us we're connecting with the, everybody around the world that that has enjoyed this story so the story is going to have this it's going to have a layer that you find as an audience member and as a composer i'm an audience member at a certain point and so yeah i, I look probably I don't do it deliberately. I don't mm. say, oh, yes, this reminds me of this situation. I'm going yeah. to. I just think it kind of comes, you know, as you try and you try and find the the most honest sort of expression that you can of what the character needs and mm. is feeling. Um, you look into yourself for that. I mean, I think that's all that music is. It's just a, you know, it's my memories of music, mm. you know, and that could be, you know. L linked to story things you know um, I mean really if I was to you know my father I remember the day after he died I, I did a concert where we played um, the Elgar uh, variations Enigma uh, and I was playing I was playing viola and uh, I just remember that being incredibly emotional next you know that particular day and forevermore you know that that piece so if I really wanted to go for it, and I wanted to bring in in number two, if I wanted to right. kill, you know, kill the father, I would have probably sounded a bit more like Elgar, but I don't think I did. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's some it comes, you know, the emotion is there, the the literal recognition of of what what you were doing, where you were doing it, how it fits with the character, not so much. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I can see. I mean, of course, everything that you live, you're, we're all sponges and we're absorbing everything around you and it's, it's projected, you know, outwards. And sometimes I'll watch a movie and there's something so painful and it reflects on me and then I'm just thinking, I'm like, did the screenwriter go through that too? Or like, I don't know where they draw it from, but it's always like, that well, that hit me, but I wonder if that they felt that pain in real life. It's always, I'm always curious about like, kind of that stuff. Um, it's, all, it's all common to everybody. Yeah. Know, across the whole earth for sure <laughs> and the history of mankind is is everybody feeling pretty much the same way about things <laughs> no we're um, we think we're so different we're all <coughs> we're all the same going absolutely. through the same yeah, things absolutely indeed. um but talking about um uh where kind of music comes from kind of looking at your whole general approach i know it's going to be different for every film but where where does the first note come from where do you kind of gravitate towards 
to find that first idea? Do you enjoy the conversation with the director? Do you like, if you can you have the opportunity to read the script, if you're on that early, or do you just like to watch the first cut? Do you have like a kind of a standard approach? Or um, I mean, with Dragon's Eye, I got an early version of the story of three, mm. um, but it did change quite a lot. And, the, and uh, I think it was early enough that I'd forgotten it by the time we actually I saw the first movie, right. the version of the movie. <coughs> I mean, one of the things I like to do is wait until the film's in some good condition. Yeah, yeah. And then I watch it, no music, no temp music, definitely. And then just try and watch it a few times through. Um, and so I, w I did that with, with Dragon 3. Um, I looked at it carefully and then I let it sort of sit in my brain a while and, you know, had some meetings with, with Dean, just started to write tunes, the new tunes I think I, I felt I needed. Right, right. Um, do those, those, those ideas, are they, do you have to like dedicate time to think about it or do you have to just like go for a walk and just let it come to you? Like, do you have to, or do you like, all right, I'm going to hunker down and come up with ideas? Well, I'd like to say that one, but <laughs> it's all the walk one, but no, it's normally just avoidance, avoidance. Um, yeah, yeah. Try and stay in bed, try not to get out of bed, try to watch television in the morning and then knowing that you're supposed to be working. So, uh, I don't well, know. Well, we talked about it last time about Getting procrastination. Harder. Yeah. And how, like, we're dis dissecting why people proca procrastinate and how you're really mapping it out in your head, right? Is that what we were talking about? We were talking about that, but that sounds yeah. like bullshit to me now. <laughs> um, I was reading another article about that the other day, and it's basically that you are, if you're really procrastinating, one of the things you might be doing is, uh, is trying to avoid failure. Mm. You know, because you're, you're feeling that you're actually not good enough. <laughs> To do this it could be too or maybe you just don't want to do it <laughs> no you want to do it because you want it to work you yeah. want it to be well for a, this but maybe it's something else that you don't, don't know. oh yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah of course for this you wanted to do it i'm not yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a good question I, i'm still stuck in it i'm right at the beginning of a film at the moment i'm so i'm this is a good question <laughs> procrastinating um in fact this very interview is procrastinating <laughs> I'm keeping you from your work. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, how long does it typically uh, take you to finalize a like a, a theme or a motif? Or once you like hunker it down, do you go through like 30, 40 versions, or you're able to kind of find the heart of it pretty quickly? Sometimes it comes kind of quick. Sometimes it's just real slow. Sometimes it's chunks and bits, or, mm -hmm. you know, and then you you're playing one tune and you suddenly realize you've gone into another tune. Um, I do try and get them up and on their feet. Uh, so I end up with kind of cues that have tunes in them that really aren't right yet. Mm. And they get to quite a late version, <laughs> uh, with full <laughs> orchestration and everything like that, and I'm still changing the tune. Um, drives everybody nuts, especially me. But sometimes you don't really understand what the tune is doing until you hear it articulated mm. in different ways, um, different tempos, different keys even. You know, changing the key of how you write the tune is can lead to all sorts of different places because mm -hmm. just the combination of the harmonics, you hear different ways forward, different ways in and out of where you were getting stuck or where it was getting dull. Um, I know I, the thing I wish I did more of was just what John Williams does so much so well, which is that kind of getting a much better rhythmic um, formula, mm. not formula, but a rhythmic kind of plan <laughs> in it. That, so that the rhythm within just the melody gives you a lot more than you need right. um, in this kind of new world of composing where you just do pads and huge drums that give you all the rhythm and then you just do these kind of very dull tunes over the top of it. I mean, that's basically what we've got to now. John Williams doesn't do that way. He, he's, uh, within the tune, there's all the rhythm you'll ever need to understand what the tune is doing, as in how vibrant or how energetic it is, or how uh, you know um, delicate it is. It's mm. in the rhythm of the melody. It doesn't even need the accompaniment to tell you that. Uh, and then it's all, it also brilliantly one of the things he does that's very hard to do with tunes is is it implies the harmony. So you don't need to put giant pads of every everything every every note on every instrument. Right. It's just part of the. Uh, the accompaniment is much more um, light because 
and not light. It's it's much more focused because mm. it doesn't it doesn't have a ne <laughs> it's not um, so much as in the tune. The harmony and the rhythms are already in the tune, so everything else is just kind of uh, just sits around it, just mm. supporting it a bit, and that means that everything can be more fluid. And these days we kind of do write a bit, you know, sort of. Um, what would be the word? Uh, you know, kind of um, like giant buildings, chunks. Oh yeah, yeah. Large, you know, monolithic. That's what I was trying to think of. Everything's mm. a bit monolithic now. So trying to get out of the habit of doing that because it's easy. Right, right. Um, and into trying to write more, more, ch more. I don't know. Thought, thoughtful tunes. Um, I don't know. It's very hard. Very hard. It is. Yeah, it's very. I still don't know how you how you do it or how anybody does it. I, I honestly don't. <laughs> I don't know when I do it better than I do it better sometimes, perhaps than other times. Um, I can't quite tell the why it happens better mm. sometimes than other times. You know, better in your eyes or just looking at what other people are saying. Like, mm, no, it's always my eyes. Yeah. I, mean, I don't care what other people say. Really, really. I mean, you can. St I can look back on these things and go, "That's a really weak." <laughs> Thing, you know, I did. And it's like, okay, well, the only way I can get away with that is just you think you say, Well, I, I'm a film composer, I don't have time. <laughs> <Like that. laughs> so, and that's a that's a cheap way out because you know, some of my favorite film composers, you know, they have compositional rigor to the nth degree, yeah, you know, so <laughs> and they and they didn't have time, yeah, you know, very but Jerry Goldsmith on Alien, he didn't have time, right, but. You want to look at that as a piece of writing, you know, it was incredible writing. So. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned, of course, John Williams. Of course, you uh, got to work with him a little bit for Solo. Um, they were you able to? Did you pick his brain? Did you? Did you get time to really? Oh, kind yeah. Of, yeah. Well, yeah, we actually found a video the other day of us doing the spotting session. Oh. Uh, nobody will ever see it, but uh, <laughs> uh, I was watching it and I was just remembering, yeah, what an amazing day it was when we went through the whole movie. Yeah. Uh, with Ron. Um, and just kind of... Did you notice just things that he's doing that nobody else is doing? I mean, you mentioned the certain things that his writing technique... Yes, I mean, absolutely. I, I, it's, it's not like he was telling me these things. It's just those are the things I've noticed. Yeah, you're observing. What he was telling me, though, was I think in the way he wrote was just... You know, he was, he was really trying to find the right language for the characters mm. and the tone of the movie. And uh, and I definitely got stuck until he, I'd been writing already, and until he really came on, and then and there was this period when we were sort of working together a, a bit, and that's really when I I I started to understand the movie a bit and understand the tone. Um, yeah, it didn't it did mean that I had to wait for him to really sort of <laughs> put his feet down uh, on the ground, but once he'd done that, I I saw I think. A way forward. It was, mm -hmm. it was it was literally like night and day. I was just like fog, and then he did his demos of of things. He did some melodies and did these demos, and it's just like everything from there onwards. I was like, okay, I know I know what to do. And I had a lot of material already that I written, and I just it just I, I understood how to use it from that point onwards. Once John had sort of set the tone. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned, of course, also Ron and uh, Ron Howard, and of course, other, you've worked with so many other great directors, and you've built long-lasting relationships, Dean, of course, or Doug Lyman, all these other great filmmakers. Um, and of course, there's, you know, there's always great working with someone that you worked with before and kind of the shorthand. But what's the key, I guess, from a composer's point of view to nailing that kind of first meeting with a new director? And how do you adapt to, I guess, different personalities? Is that your job description to be like, okay, this, this person's a little bit more reserved or this person's much bigger, louder? As, I mean, do you have to kind of shift yourself to work with different people? Or? I don't think I've, I've ever shifted that way. Um, the thing I learned to do was to look at the director's work under, and understand their tone mm. um, and what I thought they were always trying to sort of find in their work um, and then be very enthusiastic which you know obviously for an English person is a little different from <laughs> American, but um, and I almost lost jobs because I was deemed to be not enthusiastic at all. I mean, Chris Wedge, uh, on on first meeting I had with Chris Wedge uh, for Robots, 
Um, I thought it was a fabulous meeting, and then I heard that he <laughs> he said, "Well, John doesn't seem he's really nice, and I love his stuff, but he doesn't seem very keen." So I so I wrote this great big long email to him and said, "I'm sorry, Chris, you don't understand. I am English." So when I said, "You know, um, yes, that sounds interesting to me," um, what I meant was this is fucking amazing. <laughs> exactly, it was like I, I you know I I should have really kind of like set off fireworks and, yeah. <laughs> and it exploded and taken all my clothes off immediately all at the same time. And that would have kind of really <laughs> meant, that would have been an expression of how I really felt. Right. But of course it just kind of came out a little bit kind of reserved yeah. because I was trying not to, I was trying to hold it all down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's good, uh, good advice. Um, so kind of looking at your, I guess, in your position you are now in your career and your life, um, I guess, what are you still trying to crack? What are you still trying to achieve? Are there puzzles that you haven't figured out yet? <laughs> Is there stuff that you want to figure out that you don't know yet? Yeah, I mean, I wish I, I, wish I could write easy. I wish it was easier to write. You're trying to find a better way to write? Is that right? Yes. Um, and be better. Mm. But mainly be better. It's like, how can I be a better way to write better? Mm. Um, I just wish I could get it to flow better or I don't know so I mean I might just try some acid or something oh, that, well, that, that usually will do it <laughs> <laughs> um, so working in the industry uh, I think a lot of professionals out there are kind of either or finding out how much time it takes to devote to this career to this uh, profession how have you learned to balance work life, personal life? I mean, have you, is, there a key, is there a trick to it? How do you <laughs> manage the long hours and being able to take time for yourself, of course, and your family? I mean, how do you work all that out? I don't know. I mean, I tell people, I'm, I mean, it's just about being selfish. Mm. You just have to be selfish. And you have to, fortunately, have relationships with people who can put up with that. Yeah. Um, and it's... it's it's painful to look back at it sometimes. I mean, there's loads of photos of my son. He's just about to go off to college. <laughs> there's loads of photos of my son um, on holidays. And I suddenly remember, I was thinking, wow, where was that? Where was that? You know, and why am I not in any of the photos? So <laughs> I wasn't there uh, working, you know. Um, I was probably supposed to be there, but then, you know, overran or ran out of time or worked too slowly. And, you know, many times things would move. And I just wouldn't have been able to go. And so that selfishness is kind of, is built into this business. You know? yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a business that requires everything from you and you're either going to give it or, I mean, some people are much better. Some people, but that's my take on it is, I mean, you know, I know that James Newton Howard, obviously very sort of nine to five, he can get it all done, but he has had about four wives. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know. So it, 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 it's, there's a cost. Yeah. Some way. You have to there. sacrifice something. I yeah. Guess. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you are, t but you, I guess you've slowed down a bit. I mean, you've mm. taken a, a sabbatical. You've taken like a time. You know, I think there was a two years you took off or something. Yeah. I Just mean, like the, shutting things down for two years. The other way it worked. I mean, basically, I kind of, from about 2013, really, I've only done one film a year. I mean, some of them were in two in one year and then they the release, came up, the releases yeah. things. But, if you look at it since 2013, the last you know eight years, um, uh, seven years, I've, I've really only done one film a year. Um, Do you find that as a good? Yeah, it's just good for you that's and good. Plenty for me. Yeah, yeah. and I, I just like it to be a film that I care about. Mm. So that's the trick: is to try and find one that I, I really want to do. You know, I'm here on Call of the Wild, and it's just wonderful. It's a wonderful film. <laughs> Completely, you know stuck I, I, just, you know, I mean I, I sort of know what it should be I do but you know can I do it well that's going to be the question is right how well can I do it and I know I have to because the film's good it's really good and it needs it needs a really brilliant score so I don't know I'm still at that point of, <laughs> can I do that I know it needs it I know how to do it and can I do it so. <laughs> is it you ever are you ever just terrified that the ideas will stop coming they all, they never come. They always stop. I mean, I they know people stop. say that. It's like when they stop coming, they, <laughs> they ne never come. They never they come. come. <laughs> you basically you beat to... them out and squeeze them out and whatever you want to say, but they right. just don't come. I mean, oh, I, that's for me. I mean, right. I was talking to Danny Elfman the other day and he, he does, he has had those moments when things just pop into the brain. I, I, I've never had that. 
Yeah. I, I just sit down and keep hacking at it until something is not terrible. And then I hack at it a bit more until it's slightly less worse. Less worse. Do you, is that a process enjoyable or is it painful and Generally annoying? painful. Yeah. Very annoying. Um, when you get to the end of it, it's great. Yeah. I think, I think you mentioned that you, you really you strive to find, get to that finished product and have it, right? And whereas somebody like Hans is like, all the meticulous details, is that kind of in the thing? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I can be lost in the details as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Hans, I've seen Hans work in a way that he, he gets it absolutely perfectly right one bar at a time. And then he does the next 50 bars, and they're all the same. They're all right. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I find that very hard. <laughs> um, I, I have to kind of slap a lot, a lot more kind of um, wide brush strokes around. But maybe he's doing it in his brain beforehand. I don't know. Um, but then, you know, I think we all play around. Yeah. I think that's the only way. It's a play, play time. I mean, that's the thing I have to try and relax on. It's just, okay, look, this is a fucking great fun. Yeah, uh, I just get to sit here and play around and mess around and see what I can come up with. It's not actually very intellectual at all. <laughs> um, it's it's mainly instinct at a certain point. But it's still, I mean, a, a process, it's, and it's hard to talk about it too because you don't want to. I feel like I don't know. I feel like today's society, when you say the word art, or it's, it's so pretentious, like oh, this pretentious artist, like, but it's still. This human part of the brain that, I mean, I think it's such an interesting part of creativity and kind of coming up with these ideas. And it's still, yeah, it's a painful struggle. And people might be like, oh, psh, you know, making millions I mean, of dollars and making music, yeah. whatever. But it's like, <laughs> it's still I mean, that process that's... When I say painful, it's not like yeah. lifting bricks. Right. You know, it's, not, it's, it's really not that hard. Yeah. It's, it's a bit stressful. I think yeah. that's all it is. There's an anxiety to it. But, but there's an anxiety to not be able to pay your mortgage, you know, and there's yeah. an anxiety to life all the time. So I've probably forgotten just how anxious all everybody is. Yeah. Uh, and I think I'm the only one sometimes with it. So it, it, it's an unfair situation I'm in, which is that I, you know, I have it incredibly good. <laughs> and it's really an easy job. <laughs> you know, and you can do it pretty badly and still get away with it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Um, do you ever think about, I know you, just, you mentioned earlier you don't kind of pay attention to what other people are saying, but do you ever think about legacy? Do you ever think about the, the, what you're leaving behind or what you're creating now that will kind of stand the test of time? Does it ever go through your mind like your body of work? <laughs> well, it's... <clears throat> if anyone can't see, there is a, got a, a beautiful dog down here. <laughs> yeah. Say hello. Say hello. <laughs> Say hello. There you go. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it, you can get very pretentious on this stuff. I mean, of course, the, yeah, the idea yeah. is, you the idea is to write music that connects with people, mm -hmm. um, that can communicate with them. Um, and the thing I've enjoyed in my life is other people's music. So I've been able to sit there and hear, you know, music by Ravel and understood things that there's no words for and mm. there's no no other way of explaining um, and at a distance of a hundred years so I mean, it's yeah. a time machine in a way I get to talk to Ravel understand him hear what he's thinking in a way that I can't explain um, so there's a sort of a there's a metaphysical layer to this that yeah yeah that's what I've enjoyed about music so if I'm gonna do this can I get to do this in the same way mm. can I leave yeah. something behind that somebody else will enjoy in a way that that I have so uh, it's a, it's just pass it forward in, yeah, a, yeah. in a way um, whether that's everything about my life that I should care about I don't know but it, I mean bringing something beautiful into the world whether it's you know a child who's going to grow up and be wonderful or whether it's a you know an image or whether it's words or music. I mean, it's really all I could sort of hope for at the moment because I'm not really good at anything else. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, with that being said, have you, um, you've carved out this unique path uh, with your life and your career. You've lived, you've traveled, um, you've worked. At this point of your life, at this point of your life, let's get, we're gonna get a big question here. Have you figured it out 
what it all means to you. Do you know the meaning of it, of all, of it all? <laughs> Other than 42. <laughs> Other than 42. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> life of the universe and everything. What does it all mean? What does it all mean to John um, Powell? I don't know. It changes all the time. I mean, my latest take on it is, it is just... Um, yeah, I mean, try and leave something behind that's beautiful and mm. and um, and put energy into your friendships because they'll <laughs> they'll benefit you'll have a lot of uh, they benefit you yeah hugely for yeah, sure I think so I think that's about it really yeah I think um, that gets the point yeah I'm beginning to think that I've taken too much ibuprofen I'm worried about ibuprofen <laughs> I think there's something we don't know about ibuprofen that might be hurting us <laughs> not sure. Um, Pilates I've recently discovered is the most painful thing on earth. <laughs> Pilates. Um, but I'm going to try and do that. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I think that sums it up. Yeah. <laughs> well, John, thank you again for chatting, for, for, picking, for letting me pick your brain, and uh, it's always a joy. Pleasure.